Darf ich eine Eröffnungsfrage stellen? Ja. Um, I read that you were so impressed about the people from the South, that they are so great fighters and keep on no matter what. You know, with my, with my German safety thinking, I would say the shelter is not too bad. Uh, where do you think the spirit is coming from? Um, you know, it's, uh, it's kind of, um, I think it comes from having rebuilt so many times. I mean, the people, a lot of people have left the area and the people that are still there after a hundred years of hurricanes are, you know, you like, you are different molds. People that have survived so many storms, they've taught their children how to survive, their children have taught that. And, and there's a real kind of harmony with the land and with nature. And this, there's a real sense there and real pride in that, you know, you feel like, um, you know, if the government were to collapse and the banks were to fold and a storm were to destroy every, you know, grocery store, that the last people standing would be the people in, in South Louisiana. You know, you, you, you get that feeling. There's that sort of internal, like, kind of, like, macho pride, but you, you get the sense that, that it would be true. I mean, you just, just being down there, it's, it's very, feels very real, so. I have to say, you wrote the music uh, yourself, it's really amazing, it's a big part of the movie because it's uh, so, so much emotion, I would have cried the whole movie through without the music, it was helping me to be optimistic. Uh, uh, how did you do it? I mean, did you write it, uh, compose it before and, and put it then to the movie or how did this work? Um, no, the music really came after, which are other films that I've, I've written the music, you know, as soon as I have the idea, I know the theme song and this kind of all comes at once and then this one, um, was much more difficult. It was, it was, I don't think we quite figured out until uh, later on where we really realized that the, that the music is, is like a broadcast station from Hush Puppy's head at any given moment. It's like, what is the tune that she is self scoring her life with at any given moment? And so, you know, it's, um, you know, we always wanted, we always felt the film was like an adventure movie and that she was kind of like a folk hero, like Huck Finn or Robin Hood or, you know, uh, one of these kind of characters. But the actual events of the plot, it's not like there's a sheriff of Nottingham or like she has to go fetch the golden coin from the dark mountain and bring it to someone. You know, there's no events like that. And so the sense of kind of epic adventure very much comes out of her self-perception of herself as this hero. And, and the way that you know how she feels about herself is always the music. And so it was like a very important piece that once we kind of realized that we had to score her head and not the film itself, objectively, that, that's when the whole thing really started to work. Okay, Fragen von eurer Seite. You have questions, comments. Where is this girl from and how did you find her? She's from um, a town called Homa, which is very near where we shot the film. It's like the last town as you go south in Louisiana, uh, the last slightly urban place. Um, and we basically did, I mean, no one in the film had ever acted before, and so we did like a massive South Louisiana casting search for non-professional actors and you know we worked on that character for about nine months and we, we looked at about 4,000 kids over that time and, and uh, that's kind of what it took to find and we were when you're when you know when you're looking for a miracle you just need to keep on looking until it reveals itself to you and so that, that was how it worked with her it was it wasn't like there was a close competition between her and one other person it was like this amazing child walked into uh, just a library casting, you know, we, she, her aunt pulled a flyer, you know, pulled a phone number out of a deli, told her mom, her mom brought her in there. Um, so, you know, and that's, that girl saved my life. It's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I, met, I met the aunt that told her to come to the audition and it was one of the most emotional, like the, you know, just random person who pulled up a number and thought, oh, my niece would be good for this and brought her to the audition. It was like everybody in the crew was just hugging her and buying her drinks, you know, it was like this incredible moment. How much was scripted and how much was improvised during production? Um, you know, the, once we started shooting it was all scripted, um, but that script was based on improvisations or not, it's not like straight up like improvisation. There was a kind of a story and then we cast the film and then we rewrote the film to fit the actors and we asked them you know, every line, I would, you know, Dwight, Dwight who plays the father was a, is a baker. And so we would, I would go into the bakery at midnight and stay there till six in the morning uh, while he's baking dough and like rolling jelly donuts and all that kind of stuff. And you go through every line and you say, how would you say this? And he would say, ah, I'd probably say it like this. And then you'd write that down. And 
you know, we also did a lot of interviews where, you know, he's, um, you know, he lived through Katrina and he waded through 10 foot water and, you know, created an, an encampment on high ground and fed a hundred people for seven days holding out there. And so he had all this knowledge of the storm that, cause I wasn't there when it happened. And so he brought all this knowledge of what it's actually like to go through this to the script, which got written into the film. And so, you know, there's a lot of fluidity to how the script gets to where we get to when we start shooting. But once we're on set, I mean, the circumstances are so difficult that there's no way to actually improvise. I mean, when you have, you know, most of these scenes are shot, you know, you have your two actors on a boat a hundred feet away from you and all you have is a walkie-talkie. So it's not like you can say, just go for it, do whatever you want. You know, you're, you're being fairly, uh, you know, systematic once you get into those situations. So you try to rehearse out everything improvisa in improvisation and translate that to the script. Right, so we've just seen one of my all-time favorite films. Thank you very much, first off, for Thank gracing you. us with this fantastic journey. And then to the questions, um, how were you inspired by the Prothe story, and what real creature is behind the oral? <laughs> um, so, the, I mean, the, imp the inspiration came from really friends and people. It, it really came from the place, you know, it was, it was, it was um, friends of mine who I made on, on the previous film that I made, the short, who were... Uh, in New Orleans immediately after the storm and who were refusing to leave and who were refusing to be kind of pushed off their land and go somewhere safer. And it was me trying to, and I was very drawn to that. You know, I was, I was supposed to go, I, I'm from New York and I, now I've lived in New Orleans about six years and, and I was, I just got kind of hooked on it and I, and I didn't understand exactly why I was so drawn towards these people that were uh, seemingly doing something that was self-destructive, you know, and I wanted to unearth like what is it that I, respect so much and want to celebrate so much. And so that was sort of the beginning of the film, was wanting to make a film that kind of celebrated holdouts and tried to understand like why it is you hang on to something that's potentially going to drag you down to the bottom. Um, and um, so that, that's kind of where things began. Um, and then um, the Oroch's uh, are actually, um, you know, when, when we started those, I, I didn't, didn't want to use any technology as much as possible, any CG or any kind of computer generated stuff felt like it would be out of sync with the kind of culture of the bathtub, which, you know, there's no iPhones in the bathtub, so you don't want to, like, make something on an iPhone and then put it on the screen. Um, and so I tried to think about the way that Hush Puppy would, like, I always was trying to think, how would Hush Puppy make this? You know, if she was the director and she was in charge of the art department, what would be her idea? And we would try to do that. And so we used, I basically told my guys, you have to use real animals to, to create this effect, and you can't use effects. And so what they figured out eventually was um, we, we used baby uh, Vietnamese pot belly pigs. They're about this big, about that tall. Um, and we, uh, we raised them actually from infancy. And, you know, you know that you get them when, you, when they're about two weeks old. We're feeding them out of a baby bottle. Um, and then we had these nutria, this gigantic swamp rodent, and they're a pest. And so it's really cheap to get their fur. And so we basically attached horns to this giant swamp rat and then taught the pig slowly to wear this costume. Um, and <laughs> you laugh, but, uh, you know, uh, but, you know, but they could only do, you know, because originally you write this, this monster character and you're like, okay, I want Hush Puppy riding on top of an auroch and stabbing it through the eye. But, you know, you have all this kind of, uh, you want to like relive your action movie uh, childhood, but you then get a report from the Orox unit. It's like the Orox can run, stop, turn around, sit down and eat, and that's all they can do. And so if you look back at the scenes, you know, each scene is, de is designed around one thing that we could train a pig to do. Um, and, uh, you know, and then you write that into the script and that's, you know, but it was more important to me that the creatures emerged organically and that we used an organic type of effect than it was, you know, how cool, how, how much blood we could get out of stabbing one in the face. You know, it was always, like, the, the nature of that creation was more important than the actual functional things that it did. So you just try to prioritize and then, and then react to whatever crazy decision you've made. Thank you. Um, how was the film received in America? Great. <laughs> I mean, yeah, well, it came out about, it's been out almost, it's been out over two months now. It's still, still in theaters and stuff, so... Uh, yeah, I mean, it was a, it's been a crazy ride for all of us. I mean, when you're making a film like this, your basic day-to-day -day thought is, 
I'm going to get run out of the country. No one will ever let me make another film. You know, this is a disaster. Um, and, you know, the film is just, it doesn't have a genre. It doesn't have stars in it. And so you don't really expect it to play. And, but we, you know, we went to Sundance and we just had this crazy reaction from the first day we showed it and it was bought the day after we showed it. And then now Fox Searchlight's distributing it. And now I'm, you know, here in Hamburg, <laughs> showing the movie. It's it's a really it's been a wild journey for for everybody involved. Um, but you know, uh, it was much you know it's it did great in the country and it, and it played you know beautifully. We we showed it in a gymnasium down where we shot it because there aren't many movie theaters down there, and uh, and it was an amazing reaction there too. So it's really um, been wonderfully kind of universally, you know. I haven't I haven't had too many like tomatoes thrown at me, which is a relief. Yeah. So.